Did you know that New York City was home to the nation's first known brewery? Dutch immigrants, Adrian Block and Hans Christensen, opened their alehouse here in 1612. And the first commercial distillery in the U.S. was also established here, on Staten Island in 1664, again by the Dutch. Needless to say, New Yorkers like a drink or two. So that makes this a great city for finding historic watering holes. Join us as we explore some of the best that deserve a visit the next time you are in the Big Apple. We're kicking off our tour in the Financial District. Anyone who says you can't find America's history in a bar has never been to this place. Actually, they've never been to any of the places we've filmed, but I digress. Anyway, this is Francis Tavern, the oldest drinking place in all of New York City and one of the oldest tippling houses in the entire country. Aside from its longevity, Francis also has a very significant place in America's history, something we'll learn about in a bit. The Tavern, which is also a museum, sits at 54 Pearl Street in New York, surrounded by the high rises of Lower Manhattan. We were lucky enough to catch up with the museum's education director, Jennifer Patton, who guided us through this place's rich history. The building was originally built as a mansion, as a luxurious house for the Delancey family. Stephen Delancey was one of the richest uh, residents of New York City um, as a merchant. And so he started building it in 1719. Um, however, once it was completed, they, no, they never lived here. Samuel Francis purchased it in 1762 and he opened it as a Queen's Head Tavern. Considering that it was originally built as a mansion, it was a very large tavern compared to most of the other taverns in the area. So um, he was able to use different spaces for public dining, for private dining, um, in meeting spaces. The long room was the most uh, important room for special occasions to be rented out. And even though it was simply a tavern, the Queen's Head was an important place in its community. Because you come to a tavern, you find out what's happening in the community. There would be broadsides or newspapers posted there that, um, that you could read yourself or would be read aloud to the room because many could not read. And this is where you're finding out about new laws being t passed, mm -hmm. new taxes happening, um, different announcements of escaped slaves or chairs for sale or a new play happening. This is where you're learning all. It's the message board in Starbucks. I mean, basically, that's the same idea. Sam Francis himself also attracted people with certain ideals about the country, the rule of England, and about forming their own nation. He definitely sided with the patriot side, the rebel side. So the tavern reflected that. Um, that many patriots would come here and sort of talk about different ideas of, of breaking away from the British government. New York was very, was very divided. They had a lot of loyalists, a lot of patriots, a lot of people in the middle, and taverns reflected that. So there would be loyalist taverns and, and non-political taverns, but Francis Tavern most definitely was on the patriot side of things. In those turbulent times before the revolution, Francis Tavern also frequently served some of the most notable men of that time. Before the Revolutionary War began, um, different notable people, John Adams and George Washington, most definitely were frequented here. And the tavern also had a part in Evacuation Day, the day that the English left New York City, signaling the end of the war and independence. So on November 25th, 1783, this is Evacuation Day, when all the British leave uh, the harbor, or they get on their ships and start to leave and George Washington parades back into the city with his officers and soldiers and actually a, a large party was held here at Francis Tavern hosted by Governor George Clinton in honor of Washington's return. The party was lively and occupied the entire building, not just the ground floor. George Washington himself made 13 toasts of hot buttered rum to everything from the American army to the kings of Sweden and France. General Washington also used the long room on the second floor to bid farewell to his officers before resigning his commission and heading back to Mount Vernon, having served his new country. So this is the room where George Washington said farewell to his officers. It was a very brief occasion. They did not sit down and have a meal. He really? basically just gathered them. They believe it's about 40 in attendance. Um, this is right before he will be going to resign as Commander-in-Chief of the, of the Continental the Army. While it stopped being a colonial tavern in the late 1700s and fell into disrepair, it was bought by the Sons of the Revolution and restored. Now it houses museum space and galleries on the second and third floors, while using the ground floor as tavern space, just like Sam Francis did. At its core, Francis is also just a tavern. Remember that they drink back then, just like we do now. 
People drink a lot. I don't want to say they continue the tradition of serving volumes of alcohol like they used to, but geez, this place has four bars stuffed in it. They also offer a huge assortment of beer, whiskey, and a full kitchen. In all fairness, Francis Tavern ceased to exist 220 years ago, but what stands now is a reminder of where we're from. We're not Quakers. We didn't arrive in the New World and drink distilled water. We drank beer and rum and Madeira wine and anything else we could find. Sam Francis Tavern is a great reminder of that past. Like a little kid yelling, look at me! The place begs you to explore our history at every turn. And if you care at all about where we came from, you'll delightfully let yourself be taken in by this place. With any luck, the people you came with will have to search the whole building for you, only to find you in the flag gallery, contemplating the symbols used 240 years ago to free our country from tyranny. It's really not often that you can contemplate these things and then retire for a drink. Francis Tavern is one of those few places that truly brings our past alive. Though nowadays in the Big Apple, you can get a beer on just about every street in the city, back in the day, it was a bit more difficult. In fact, when New York was first founded, back when it was known as New Amsterdam by its Dutch residents, there wasn't a single bar or brewery in sight. But that changed in 1612, when explorer Adrian Block, along with brewer Hans Christensen, founded the first brewery in New York. In fact, it was the first known brewery in all of America. Sitting in a log building on the southern tip of what is now Manhattan, Block and Christensen's brew house served an important function. Water was untrustworthy to the Dutch settlers because in the crowded cities of Europe it was often polluted by sewage and other pollutants. Water could make you sick. But beer would not. Because it was boiled in the brewing process, the bacteria and bugs that caused illnesses were cooked out of it, leaving a delicious beverage the whole family could enjoy. Seriously, even the kids were downing suds back then. Yay! Usually it was up to the women of the house to make the family's beer. But it wasn't always the best tasting stuff. <laughs> God bless her for trying, though. And besides, the town was overrun with sailors, fur trappers, and traders. Simply too many people for the overworked wives and moms to supply. The commercial brew house that Block and Christensen founded could supply beer to the growing settlement and help keep the explorers and fur trappers happy and healthy. The place was apparently so popular, it was even used for other activities. You see, the first white male born in America was actually born in the small log brewery. His name was Jean Vignet, and he would later grow up to be, guess what? That's right, a brewer. Only in New York. We turn now to the Bowery. This area of New York once comprised the eastern border of the slums known as the Five Points. The city's poorest of the poor lived here, and so what followed was crime, gangs, and of course, saloons. It's here we find our next stop. Sitting comfortably in the shade on East 7th Street in the East Village of New York City, it's one of the most iconic historic bars left in the United States. McSorley's Old Ale House. Someone once told us you could teach a high school history class in McSorley's Old Ale House, and he was right. This place is like an informal history class where the bartender acts as teacher and guide. And to guide us through the bar's history, we talked to Pepe, who's been at McSorley's for over 30 years. This was one of a million places in this part of town. In 1854, you couldn't fall down in this neighborhood without falling into a tavern, a bar, a pub, or whatever. This is the Bowery. The Bowery was bar after bar after bar after bar after bar. It was the worst degenerate place in, in the whole city. It was because the Bowery is synonymous with uh, bums, vagrants, out of work actors, you, know, you name it. And uh, this is one of the few that survived. And it was in this Bowery that Irish immigrant John McSorley chose to create his tavern. John McSorley was born in 1827 in County Tyrone, Ireland. He immigrated to the U.S. like thousands of his countrymen and women in 1851. Within a few years of his arrival, he opened up a tavern called The Old House at Home. What's amazing about this story is that we can speak about the place as something that's still here. Oh sure, there are other old bars around, but they've changed names and owners and even identities. But the magic of McSorley's is that it hasn't changed a thing. But how is that possible? Why did Survive for a lot of different reasons. Luck. Across the street, there's a new building right now. Mm -hmm. It's part of a school called Cooper Union. But back in the 1860s, there was a building there called Tompkins Market. 
and they had a huge roof and it was part market, part drill area, meaning the soldiers would drill on its roof. I mean, do it there, whatever, drilling, or whatever soldiers do. And uh, the 69th Regiment was called back from the Civil War to protect this neighborhood because they were having draft riots. Draft riots were people who couldn't pay their way out of fighting in the Civil War. Some people paid their way out. They called them draft riots. The poor couldn't pay their way out. So what happens? They start uh, looting and burning and rioting. Abe Lincoln calls uh, the 69th Regiment back. We're lucky because they're right across the street. Yeah. The rest of the neighborhood goes up in smoke. Wow. And that's just one example of why we're still here. And nothing in the place has changed. Nothing. They hang a picture, it stays there for 100 years or longer. Abraham Lincoln stands on a chair for a rally. They put it above the icebox, stuff it full with a bunch of other stuff, and it stays there for, you guessed it, another 100 years. And take these wishbones. The story goes that John McSorley would give an ale and turkey dinner to soldiers going off to war. They hung them up as they left, and when they returned, they took their bone down. So those hanging belong to the guys who never came back. They're still there, hanging on the gas lap like the days the soldiers left. Everything in this joint should be in a museum. And in truth, it kind of is. People wander in, buy a couple of ales for admission, then they sit down at one of the small, ancient, scarred tables scattered throughout the tavern, and they examine the exhibits around them. And speaking of ale, that's all they serve here. Two kinds, light and dark. John McSorley sold only his item, his product, uh. his work. When he turned his place over to his son, William, John found out that William introduced liquor. Because everybody was selling liquor. Uh -huh. John came back, fired his son, took the place back over. Next, you know, and said, I don't want you selling a liquor here. I want you, if ale's not strong enough, then uh, you, know, you can't work here. William got rid of the liquor and uh, he worked here for 65 years afterwards. Their motto used to be good ale, Raw onions, no ladies. That's right, since their founding, McSorley's has been a men-only tavern, and they were fiercely proud of it, denying even one of the owners of the place, who happened to be female, entrance until Sunday night after they'd closed. But that changed August 10, 1970, when the National Organization for Women won their Supreme Court battle against the bar, and McSorley's was thrown open to the gentler sex. Luckily, the walls are still standing, and the sky didn't fall. In fact, McSorley's is even more popular as a result, and now is perhaps the destination bar in New York City. As we said about other places, there's just too much history to cram into this program. We could talk about the sawdust on the floor or the 150-year-old original bar. We could talk about JFK's original death certificate or the paper announcing Lincoln's assassination. We could talk about these things all day because there's just so much history to this place. But the best thing to do is come here and see the bar for yourself. Buy a couple of veils for entry and spend half a day just looking at the walls. Talk to Pepe or whoever's behind the bar at the time and enjoy one of the U.S.'s landmark bars. Did you know that New York City was home to the very first distillery in America? Well, technically it was Staten Island, but seeing as how it's one of the five boroughs, it still counts. Anyway, the year was 1641, and Willem Kieft, director of the Dutch colony of New Netherlands, established the distillery to provide a tasty and familiar beverage to the colony's residents. The distillery specialized in something the Dutch couldn't get enough of, Jennifer. Jennifer is more or less the Dutch version of gin, a neutral spirit flavored with botanicals like hops and juniper berries at about 50% alcohol. The stuff can pack quite a wallet. For the Dutch, this probably wasn't a big deal. They'd been drinking it for years. But for others, like the local Native American tribe, the Muncie Indians, the stuff was downright dangerous. And, as alcohol can do, it would ultimately lead to some big problems. You see, despite laws against selling or giving booze to Native Americans, a group of Dutch traders decided to get the local Muncies drunk with their good old-fashioned Dutch Jennifer. Then, while the Muncies were sleeping off, the traders robbed them, 
stealing furs and other valuables from them. The next day, no doubt with splitting headaches, the Muncie members straggled over to the Staten Island colony to get their property back. But, instead of being given their stolen furs, they were told to pound sand by Cornelius Mellon, the leader of the Staten Island colony. The Muncies didn't seem to handle this insult very well, or maybe they were just pissed off and hung over. In either case, they briefly conferred, and then set about completely destroying the colony, including the beloved distillery. No more Jennifer would flow from Staten Island. Eventually, other distilleries would break ground in New York, but sadly, none of them would ever again make that sweet Dutch treat, Jennifer. Our final stop takes us next to the Hudson River, to the historic address of 326 Spring Street. Built sometime before 1812, this small, three-story building at 326 Spring Street houses some of the most notable living history left in New York City. You see, much of our past, the past that has to do with what really shaped our nation, our neighborhood bars, has faded away. We've tried our best to preserve them through these programs, but 326 Spring Street, also known as the James Brown House, is living, breathing history, a sublime combination of our past and our present. We're at the Ear Inn, resident of the ground floor of the James Brown House and watering hole to the waterfront of Lower Manhattan. Once a pretty sordid area, the Ear Inn now sits just off the intersection of Greenwich and Spring, not quite Soho, but still finding itself trendy. Though crowded and busy, as it normally is on Friday nights, bartender Gary Lawler was nice enough to take a break and tell us about the history of the bar and the building that houses it. Uh, built 1817, and it was, um, it was reportedly owned by an aide to uh, Washington by the name of James Brown. He's yeah. in that, he's one of the black guy in a very famous photograph of him crossing the Delaware. Gary's talking about this painting, one of the most famous paintings of George Washington. It was done by the 19th century artist Emanuel Lutz, and it's of Washington crossing the Delaware, and was painted in 1851. In front of the boat, next to Washington, is painted an African-American soldier. Now legend contends that this is James Brown, a Revolutionary War veteran and reportedly an aide to General Washington. Both his existence in the painting and the legend that he was an aide to Washington are speculation. But what we do know is that there was a Revolutionary War vet by the name of James Brown who built this building in 1817. He opened up first a tobacco shop and was apparently very successful at it. In 1833, he sold the building, which was only about five feet from the Hudson at the time. He sold it to Thomas Cloak, who opened a bar on the ground floor. There's been a bar here ever since. Naturally, because of its proximity to the water, its history includes selling liquor and alcohol to nearby passing ships and sailors. It was a pretty rough area, serving both river pirates and the immigrant gangs of New York and there was even a brothel upstairs at one point. Part of its legacy is seen above the bar in the many large bottles and containers used to store liquor and beer on ships. These bottles and the artifacts displayed on the second floor were found in the basement of the building and some of them date back to the 1700s. Gary took us on a quick tour of the top floors of the James Brown House and it's amazingly well preserved. It's got original plank flooring and fireplaces. You really get a sense of what it may have been like so long ago. Like historically speaking, do you know what, what these rooms were devoted to? Brothel. These were brothel rooms. Were they really? Mm -hmm. yeah, brothels, huh? Mm -hmm. Look at them. Bit of action going one, two, three, <laughs> you know, and four. <laughs> this place has got a long, continuous legacy. During Prohibition, the bar was even a speakeasy, with liquor and beer sold out of the second floor. But in the 1970s, the building, by that time a historical landmark, was purchased, and in 1977, Gary's family reopened the bar. But because of landmark restrictions, they couldn't put up a sign. So they got creative. It's a la listed a landmark building, so therefore you're not allowed to touch the front of it, obviously. Yeah. And there used to be a magazine upstairs called The Ear Inn, and what he did was uh, come up with a brilliant idea of pa painting the bee, making it into an ear, and there we have uh, our ear without, gotcha. without touching the front of the building. Does that actually mess with uh, it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that, that works that way. The Ear Inn, and not just the building, has become a landmark in its own right, and a beloved spot that stays crowded most every night by a variety of visitors. It's a very neighborhood crowd. A lot of people have been coming here since before I even got here, and I've known them that long. They're still here. A lot few of them, are, quite a few of them have passed, <laughs> right, right. as they do, but... Uh... And it's a local crowd that is serious about the bar as a bar. No loud music, no cell phones, just atmosphere. I noticed he had one TV and the volume was all the way down. 
Yeah, we actually yeah, have two. There's oh, one yeah, above two. your head, yeah. Um, yeah. We have two, but yeah, we don't put the volume up. Yeah. It's like for visuals only. So it's um, more for talking and yeah. hanging out. Exactly. They also serve a short menu of bar and local cuisine. Do you serve food? We do. Our food is um, very good food, actually, and it ranges from, uh, you know, appetizers are like from $6 to 8 and uh, our main courses would be from anywhere from 10 to 12, and I think we went up to 14 recently, which is like, it's very basic food. Um. We wouldn't call it basic, though. We tried the smoked trout, the chicken pie, the steamed mussels, and the shrimp salad, all highly recommended and perfectly combined with their ear-in ale. Now, What's the, uh, the ear in ale? Where, where do you get that from? Uh, that's made that? by Brooklyn. Um, oh, Brooklyn okay. Brewery make that for us. Steve Finley is very good friends with my uncle. and Them two guys come up with it and uh, so put they the have ear their in. Own just for yeah, you? just for there. We're the only ones that have it. So. And what about sweet foo foo signature drinks? Is there a signature drink that we've got to get from now? Uh, we get it. A pint of Guinness and a shot of Jameson. <laughs> he wasn't kidding either. Gary takes this stuff seriously. Today, the small bar, with walls lined with decades worth of decor, is crowded just about every night of the week, with people from every walk of life. With all its history, notoriety, and infamy, this place is just really, really cool. The Erin is like that. It's taken its knocks over the years and served its time serving some of the most undesirable of the city. Now, it's trendy, and it deserves to be trendy. The only hope is that it stays trendy and stays open for a long, long time. We hope you enjoyed a visit to some of New York City's most historic pubs, and we hope that you make it a point to stop by them the next time you visit the Big Apple. But while we showed you our three favorites, there are plenty more to choose from. So make sure you take the time to explore the city's notable watering holes, and we'll see you on the next episode of Bucket List Bars.